Good morning, everyone. It is good to be gathered to worship this morning, even though we can't be together. My name is Linda Patton Cowie, and I'm the minister here at St. Mark's Presbyterian Church in Aurelia. This morning, I'm recording this service from the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, specifically Ojibwe and Chippewa peoples. This land is covered by Lake Simcoe Treaty 16 and the Jay Collins Land Purchase. May we all live up to our obligations as treaty peoples, and may we live with respect for the original peoples and the land they have stewarded for centuries. This morning I'm joined by Larry Windrum, our recording engineer. Terry Terrian, our music director, is recording the music from her home as she is not feeling well, and she's obeying the public health directives to stay home. So we wish you well, Terry, and are grateful that you're able to send your beautiful music our way through the miracle of technology. We hope to be all together again next week. As we prepare to worship, let's take a moment just to quiet our hearts and our minds. Our call to worship this week comes from Psalm 71. God alone is our refuge and hope, our shelter and protection. From our very first breath to our last, God's love and compassion never fails. So come, lift your voices in praise to God. Bear witness to God's acts of mercy and love. Proclaim God's glory to all who will listen. Let us worship God together, even while we are apart. Our introit this week is Let There Be Love, which is number 73 in St. Mark's songbook. I would invite you to join in singing that now. I would invite you to turn your hearts to God in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, who made all things and is beyond our imagining, thank you for the gift of life, the gift of this day, and the gift of this time and space. Jesus Christ, who came into our world to be with us, thank you for your healing presence, your life, and your friendship. Spirit of God, who animates us with the resurrection life of God, breathe on us, be present to us, 
and give life to our worship. Though we see dimly, though we know only in part, though you are a mystery, we long for you, we look for you, we wait for you, Holy One. Merciful God, your word says love is patient and kind. We confess the times when we have been impatient and unkind. Your word tells us that love does not envy, that it does not boast, and that it is not proud. We confess that sometimes we have been envious and boastful and proud. Your word says that love is not rude and that it is not self-seeking, but we confess that in many ways we have been inconsiderate of those around us, thinking only of ourselves. Your word tells us that love is not easily angered and that it keeps no record of wrongs. We confess how quickly we sometimes fly off the handle and how carefully we keep score when we have been wronged. Your word says that love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth, that it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Help us, Lord, not to take pleasure in what is evil, but to always rejoice in the truth of your love. Protect us with your love, Lord, and help us to choose the way of trusting you putting our hope in you and persevering in your ways, knowing that love never fails and that you never fail. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, hear these promises we find in God's word. God is compassionate and gracious slow to anger, abounding in love. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our sins. Thanks be to God whose love and forgiveness are steadfast. May we be steadfast in our forgiveness of one another. Thanks be to God for this wonderful gift. Amen. Our hymn is Though I May Speak, and you will find the words printed to that hymn uh, in the order of service attached to this service.
for today is a very sweet book, I think. It's entitled Somebody Loves You, Mr. Hatch, and it is written by Eileen Spinelli, and the pictures are by Paul Yalowitz. Mr. Hatch was tall and thin, and he did not smile. Every morning at 6.30 sharp, he would leave his brick house and walk eight blocks to the shoelace factory where he worked. At lunchtime, he would sit alone in a corner, eat his cheese and mustard sandwich, and drink a cup of coffee. Sometimes he brought a prune for dessert. After work, he would make two stops, at the newsstand to get the paper, and at the grocery store to buy a fresh turkey wing for his supper. After supper, he read the paper, took a shower, and went to bed early. He keeps to himself. That is what everyone said about Mr. Hatch. One Saturday, when Mr. Hatch stepped onto the porch with his dustpan and broom, he got a surprise, a package wrapped in brown paper. He had never spoken to the postman before. Thank you, Mr. Goober, he said. Mr. Goober smiled. You're welcome. I always enjoy delivering packages. Mr. Hatch tore the brown paper off. Inside was a white box, which he opened to find another box. This one was heart-shaped all satiny red with a pink bow on top. It was filled with candy. Something fluttered to the porch floor. It was a little white card. He picked it up. It said, Somebody loves you. Only then did he remember that this was Valentine's Day. Mr. Hatch wondered and wondered. Now, who would send this to me? He was all alone. He had no friends, and yet someone, someone had sent him a valentine. Who? Who? He put the box on the coffee table and tried to do some dusting, but every time he left the room, he had to keep peeking to see if the box was still there. He dusted and dusted, and the dust cloth seemed to whisper, Somebody loves you. Somebody loves you. At last, he flung the dust cloth away and exclaimed, Why, I've got a secret admirer. And then he did something he had never done before. He laughed. He laughed and danced and clapped his hands. And then he took a piece of candy from the box and ate it. Mr. Hatch changed his shirt and found some old aftershave in the bottom drawer. He splashed it on his face. He picked out a yellow tie with blue polka dots and put it on. And then he went for a walk. Maybe, he thought, I will meet the person who sent me the candy. Of course, no one had ever seen Mr. Hatch wearing a tie or smelling of aftershave or smiling, so he got a lot of attention. Mrs. Weed tripped over her dog. Mr. Dunwoody nearly fell off his ladder and little Tina Finn spilled all the toys out of her wagon. Mr. Hatch waved hello to them all. On Monday, it was back to work. At lunchtime, Mr. Hatch sat in the middle of the cafeteria. He spoke to everyone and passed out chocolates from his heart box. On the way home, as usual, he stopped at the newsstand. Mr. Smith handed him the usual newspaper. I think I'll have a pack of mints, said Mr. Hatch, not as usual. Mr. Smith was shocked. Was that you speaking, Mr. Hatch? Indeed it was, said Mr. Hatch. I said I would also like a pack of mints. And if you don't mind my saying so, Mr. Smith, you don't look very well today. Mr. Smith recovered from his shock to reply, You're right, I, I don't feel very well. I have a cold. I was supposed to go to the doctor's this afternoon, but the stand has been so busy I haven't had the time. Mr. Hatch smiled. Why, I'd be happy to watch the stand for you while you go. Mr. Smith could hardly believe his ears. You would? 
Certainly, just show me what to do. And so Mr. Hatch ran the newsstand for an hour. He wondered if any of the women who stopped by to buy a paper or a magazine or a candy bar had sent him the mysterious valentine. When Mr. Smith returned, Mr. Hatch made his usual stop at the grocery store. I'm a little tired of turkey wings, he told Mr. Todd. I think I'll have a nice fresh slice of ham. Mr. Todd weighed the meat and wrapped it. You look worried, said Mr. Hatch. I am, said Mr. Todd. My little girl is late. She hasn't come home from school yet, and I can't leave the store to look for her until my wife arrives. Goodness, why didn't you say so, said Mr. Hatch. I will go look for her. And so he walked to school and found little Melanie Todd by the swings and brought her home. Thank you, thank you, said the grocer. Any time, said Mr. Hatch. After supper, Mr. Hatch did not bother to read the paper. He decided to bake brownies instead. It would be nice to have brownies to share the next day with the people at the shoelace factory. As he baked, the warm chocolate smell of brownies floated through the neighborhood. Children gathered round Mr. Hatch's house, sniffing the air. Well, I suppose the factory can wait, said Mr. Hatch as he looked out the window, and he brought out two platefuls. Now, what are brownies without lemonade, he said, and he stirred up a nice cold pitcher. When the parents came to gather their children, they had some brownies too. It turned out to be a picnic in Mr. Hatch's backyard. He dusted off an old harmonica and played songs he remembered from his boyhood. Everyone danced. And so the days and weeks went by. When Mr. Hatch wasn't smiling, he was laughing. And when he wasn't laughing, he was helping someone. And when he wasn't helping someone, he was having a party in his yard or on his porch. He seemed to have forgotten about finding the person who sent him the valentine. Then one afternoon, Mr. Goober, the postman, came to his door. His face was very serious. Come in, Mr. Goober, said Mr. Hatch. You look upset. I am upset, he said. I made a mistake some time ago. My supervisor is very angry with me. Do you, do you? Yes, Mr. Goober, what is it? Do you recall the package I delivered to you on Valentine's Day, I think it was? Yes, I believe so, replied Mr. Hatch, beginning to feel a little uneasy. I don't suppose you still have it, said Mr. Goober sadly. As a matter of fact, said Mr. Hatch, I still have the box. The candy is gone, though. Why do you ask? The postman took a deep breath. I'm afraid I delivered it to the wrong address. It was supposed to go to another house. Mr. Hatch recalled tearing off the brown paper. It had never occurred to him to look at the address. He fetched the heart-shaped box and the pink bow and gave them to the postman. I do hope your supervisor won't be too angry with you now. The postman was heading down the sidewalk when Mr. Hatch called from his porch. Mr. Goober, I forgot something. He gave the postman the little white card that said, Somebody loves you. Alone in his living room, Mr. Hatch sighed. Nobody loved me after all. And then he read the paper and took a shower and went to bed early. The next morning at 6.30 sharp, Mr. Hatch left his brick house and walked eight blocks to the shoelace factory. At lunchtime, he sat in the corner by himself, ate his cheese and mustard sandwich and drank a cup of coffee. After work, he stopped at the newsstand for his paper, but he did not speak to Mr. Smith. And when he ordered his turkey wing from Mr. Todd, he did not smile. Nor did he pat little Melanie Todd on the head or bake brownies or have picnics or parties or play his old harmonica anymore. Everyone whispered, What is wrong with Mr. Hatch? Mr. Goober, the postman, told them. 
We love Mr. Hatch, insisted Mr. and Mrs. Dunwoody. He gave us flowers for our garden. He helped to mend our back fence. Mrs. Weed nodded. I love him, too. He saved his bones for my dog, Ruffy. Ruffy barked. She loved Mr. Hatch, too. Mr. Smith told everyone how Mr. Hatch had watched his newsstand so he could visit the doctor, and Mr. Todd told everyone how Mr. Hatch had found his little girl. All the children in the neighborhood remembered Mr. Hatch's wonderful brownies and lemonade, and most of all, his laughter. Poor Mr. Hatch, they said. What can we do? Then Mr. Goober announced, I have an idea. On Saturday morning, Mr. Hatch woke to a bright and sunny day. He put on his old overalls and went out to the porch with his dustpan and broom. He couldn't believe his eyes. All over the porch were red and white hearts and pink bows. There were boxes of candy on the chairs and yellow streamers flowing from the ceiling. And sticking up out of his mailbox was a shining silver harmonica. The front yard was filled with people, happy, smiling people. They were holding up a huge sign with hand-painted letters. It said, Everybody Loves Mr. Hatch. Mr. Hatch dabbed a tear at a tear with his handkerchief. I do believe, he sniffed, somebody loves me after all. And then he smiled, and then he laughed, and then he hurried down to be with his friends. You know, there's a quote that I read by C.S. Lewis that I think speaks very much to the message of that book. C.S. Lewis says, Don't waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. Before we turn to read scripture, let's ask God to bless our reading of God's word. Let us pray. Holy God, humble us and open us to your life-giving word. As we hear your word read and proclaimed today, may our hearts and minds be open to the Spirit's moving and to Jesus' teaching. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from the epistle to the church in Corinth from St. Paul, from 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 to 13. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I become an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these is love. And our gospel reading today is taken from the gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 16 to 30. 
When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, we're talking about Jesus here, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine all over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. In the name of God the Father, our Creator, God the Son, our Redeemer, and God the Spirit, our Sustainer. Amen. What does love look like? Well, I think that's one of those questions that if you asked 10 different people, you'd likely get 11 different answers. And the answers you would receive would differ depending on the situation and the context and the society you live in. For Christians, though, the answers might be significantly different from others. At least, I hope they would be. I was reminded this week of that wonderful book by Marjorie Williams entitled The Velveteen Rabbit. And I want to share with you an excerpt from it because it gives us a glimpse into what one aspect of love may look like. What is real? asked the rabbit one day when they were lying side by side near the nursery fender before Nana came to tidy the room. Does it mean having things that buzz inside you and a stick-out handle? Real isn't how you are made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt, asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. When you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up, he asked, or bit by bit? It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily or have sharp edges or have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you're real, 
most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in your joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all because once you are real, you can't be ugly except to people who don't understand. I suppose you are real, said the rabbit. And then he wished he had not said it, for he thought the skin horse might be sensitive. But the skin horse only smiled. The boy's uncle made me real, he said. That was a great many years ago. But once you are real, you can't become unreal again. It lasts for always. What a sweet interpretation of the power and effect of love. Now, both of our scripture readings today describe what love looks like. The portion of St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians that we read is very familiar to most of us. It's often trotted out at weddings to describe the ultimate example of what the nervous couple should aspire to in their relationship. But that's not why St. Paul wrote it. In fact, if you read what comes before this in Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, you'll find that chapters 1 to 12 are chock full of a narrative of divisions and conflicts and just plain old selfishness among the followers of Jesus. Again and again, Paul uses various word pictures to point out what these Christians can be what they are called to be. Siblings in a household, fellow workers in the fields, connected stones that form a holy temple, various parts of a human body knit together and operating as one. That's the goal, he says. That's the dream for God's people. And for 12 chapters, Paul offers everything he can think of to entice and persuade these followers of Christ to break out of their divided and conflicted and selfish patterns. Oh, they talked a good talk, Paul admits, but there was a notable, noticeable disconnect between their professed spirituality and their lack of concern for one another and for others around them. And so Paul paints a picture for them of a still more excellent way to live as followers of Christ. You see, Paul knew that the greatest image of what love truly looks like is Jesus Christ on the cross, where Jesus gave us everything to show his love for us. Christ on the cross that's what love looks like. When Paul declares that love never fails, he's not talking about feelings or lust or infatuation, because they all fade. He talked about the kind of love that demands that we make a choice and a decision every day. We decide to do what is right and just and generous for one another, not because we'll get something in return, but because it's the right and generous and Christ-like thing to do. And we do it even when we don't feel like it. Now I have to say, I love it when love looks lovely. When we see parents holding their sweet babies for the first time, when two people stand before me and make vows before God and each other on their wedding day, looking absolutely radiant. When we see couples who've been married for most of their lives, walking hand in hand and gazing at each other just as they did on their wedding day. Well, that's all lovely, isn't it? But authentic love doesn't always look like that. It's not always easy or pretty, or sweet. Anyone who's had a child could tell you that sometimes love looks like walking the floor for hours with a howling infant when you're so sleep deprived you can barely put one foot in front of the other. 
Love looks like sitting up all night rubbing the back of your toddler who has a cough and a fever and just can't sleep. Love looks like waiting up for your teenager who hasn't come home and has forgotten to call. Love looks like a parent desperately trying to offer solace after the first broken heart. In my own life, I got to see love lived out up close and personal. My dad was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease when I was about 10. And he lived fairly well within the restrictions that disease imposed on his body. Until, when I was in first year university, the doctors decided that he would be better on a new medication and they stopped all of his other medications, cold turkey. He had cut the grass the day before he entered the hospital to try this new regime. And a few weeks later, he came home by ambulance because all of his muscles and soft tissues had seized up, never to return to their previous state. And he never walked again. He was, for all intents and purposes, bedridden. And my mom, through all of this, was teaching grade two. And she continued to teach and do it well, even while taking care of my dad every hour she wasn't at school. I'm sure you can imagine what a toll that took on her. After her retirement, the doctor finally told her that she had to put my dad into long-term care or she would end up hospitalized herself. And even then, she went every day to see him, to ensure she was there to feed him dinner. It didn't matter what the weather, she was there caring for him. Love never ends, even when it's not easy. One of my favorite preachers, Father Michael Renninger, tells the story of his grandmother, who was in much the same position as my mom. His grandfather had had a stroke and needed to be fed through a feeding tube in his stomach. His grandmother, too, cared for her husband, who was confined to a hospital bed in the front room of their house. One day, when Michael was a young 19-year-old student, he stopped in to visit them. He recalls, you know when you walk into a room and, and you know something is wrong, but you're not sure what it is? Well, that's what happened to him that day. He wasn't sure what was wrong until he noticed that the liquid food his grandma was trying to put into her husband's feeding tube had spilled, and it was oozing all over his grandpa, and the bed, and everyone was upset. Now remember, he was a 19-year-old male, and his first inclination was to quietly slip out as no one had noticed his presence yet. But the screen door squeaked as he tried to open it, and his grandma looked up and said to him, Don't you dare. Don't you dare leave, because sometimes love looks like this. And she was right. Sometimes that's what love looks like up close. It's messy. Love is a demanding vocation. Now, if we were to take one step back and look at love from the perspective of our community, what does love look like? Well, in our time, in these pandemic times, it looks like wearing a mask even when it's uncomfortable and you'd rather not. It looks like getting your vaccinations. It looks like staying home when you're sick, checking in on your neighbor you haven't seen for a few days. It looks like obeying public health guidelines. It looks like saying thank you to your health care providers and to the grocery store workers and truck drivers who ensure we have food to eat. It looks like asking how they are doing and really meaning it given the stress they are all under. 
And when we take one further step back, we see what Jesus was talking about in our gospel reading today. In his hometown, in his own synagogue, he announces that he has come to fulfill Isaiah's prophetic promise. He has come to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and proclaim a year of favor from God. Jesus was answering the question, what does God's love look like? Well, it looks like compassion and inclusion, tenderness and attention for the outcast, forgiveness for the sinner and welcome for the stranger. This is what God's love looks like when it shines through the person of God's son, Jesus. But the townspeople who had watched Jesus grow up, they weren't so sure that they wanted love to look like that. They wanted God's love to look like their own imperfect love, limited and controlled. They wanted God's love to look like their love, given to some, but not others. So some are in and some are out. Some are included, some are excluded. Some are loved, some are hated. But God's love is for all and offered to all and available to all in ways that break down the walls that we build that divide people. They concluded they didn't want God's love to look like that. They didn't want God's love to look like Jesus. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we don't always want love to look like that either, do we? The world doesn't always want love to look like Jesus' love, authentic and universal. And so Jesus is rejected and condemned, and he goes to the cross to show us what love really looks like. When love breaks our hearts, when love is costly, we need to remember Jesus on the cross because sometimes love looks like that. What would happen if we took Jesus and St. Paul at their, world, at their word and loved each other with a fierce and faithful Christian love? If we realized that sometimes we will have to pay a price to ensure that love never fails. Without love, we are nothing. Our every action reveals Christ's love for God's people. So what could love look like in your life and in our life together? Could it look like feeding the hungry and clothing the poor, visiting the lonely, working for justice, welcoming the stranger and caring for creation, making daily decisions to live more simply so all may simply live? Could it look like stooping down low enough to serve, to wash someone's feet? Love looks like sacrifice and service. Michael Renninger reminded me that always, always, always love looks like Jesus. And sometimes love looks like us. The late great Archbishop Desmond Tutu once noted, our ordinary acts of love and hope point to the extraordinary promise that every human life is of inestimable value. My friends, there's nothing easy about choosing to love. But by God's grace and our ongoing choices, we can truly love in intentional, practical, and ordinary ways. And in doing so, we can transform our world and be transformed in the process. 
Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn is Although I Speak with Angel's Tongue, which is number 695 in the Book of Praise. I would invite you to sing that with us now. Please join with me as we turn our hearts to God in prayers for the world. Let us pray. Eternal God, you call us to a more radical love than just words cross-stitched on a pillow or framed on the wall by our bedroom nightstand can convey. You call us to a love that includes those who hate us, those who we consider our enemies, those who demean and humiliate us. But how, how can we love them? How can we feel anything but disdain for awful people who treat us terribly? Grant us the courage and the strength, Holy God, to hold to that which is good. We ask that you grant us patience in our practice of love. Help us to not hit send on that scathing email that is so justified. Help us to pause, to breathe in and exhale out. Help us to listen more, to seek understanding and to approach those with whom we disagree with curiosity, humility and openness. Help us to listen for the story beneath others' stories. Peace-loving God, help us to not provoke others with hard certainties. Let us not be uncompromising and insistent on our own way. Open us to dialogue and to opinions different from our own. Build our endurance for bridge building across barriers of difference. O oh God, we bring before you the unfolding situation in Ukraine as Russian troops gather on the border. It is heavy on our hearts and minds. We pray that you would help us to wage peace in our segregated world, that you would diffuse the tension between world powers, that you would protect the innocent. Use us to do what we can to ensure peace. And finally, inspire us by your love through Christ's life, death, and resurrection. Transform us in this love to live as Christ's disciples. Bless those who in these pandemic times are suffering, despairing, and grieving, and most in need of love. United as the body of Christ, we lift these prayers to you our Savior. Amen. Well, as we have read today, the Apostle Paul reminds us that the greatest of gifts is love. 
The blessings that we all enjoy in life speak of God's love for us. What we offer to God speaks of our love for the one who has reached out to us in Jesus. May our gifts share that love with God's world. Please join with me in prayer as we offer our gifts to God. God of life and love, we are grateful for all you have given us in Christ and in creation, in community and in the church that bears Jesus' name. We offer our gifts to you in love, trusting that you will bless them and us. May all that we offer become tangible expressions of your love at work in this world. For Christ's sake. Amen. Our final hymn is number 102 in St. Mark's songbook, Walk With Me. Life is short, and there is not much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk the way with us. So make haste to love, be swift to be kind. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>